Now you might look at eight eyes and say, this is just Castlevania. Eight Eyes was released in 1988 for the NES. It was developed by Thinking Rabbit, best known for being the creators of Sokoban, which is the origin of these block-pushing type games. With how obscure this company is, even saying best known with hesitance is kind of a stretch. They put out games from 1982 to 95 to sporadic success. Uh, there's nothing really that interesting about the development or history of Eight Eyes, so why am I talking about it? Uh, b because it's October and I didn't feel like doing a Castlevania video. Eight Eyes is an action platformer that takes obvious inspiration from you know what, but has enough kind of interesting ideas to stand on its own. Uh, to get it out of the way, yes, the graphical style is heavily aping Castlevania's recognizable blocks and staircase look, but the resemblances kind of stop there, although there are skeletons. No, Eight Eyes ditches the overt horror homages for a globe-spanning journey to invade fortresses in eight distinct locales. I have to give it to Thinking Rabbit, each level is unique looking, and the music is really solid. Upon booting up this game, my reaction was, oh, I mean, I knew this was Castlevania, but it's also Mega Man. I will also give it to the designers, this is a neat decision, although we will later find out that it was the wrong decision. This game isn't bad, it's just... special. Without any idea as to what I'm doing, I figured Arabia was as good a starting point as any. It was not. It was the worst one. Here I am, in Arabia, just a boy and a bird. The main character is a swordsman slash falconer named Orin, and you take control of both him and his falcon, Cutrus. Cutrus? Sutrus? Cutrus. Cutrus. If you have someone on the second controller, they can actually play as the bird directly. But I don't have any friends. Okay, I've got an attack, a jump, and hitting down and A does... Quieres? Whack a switch to open the gate and let's go! Oh, 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 oh. Immediately, I'm beset by a few things. Number one, these bats, which are very clearly just the Medusa heads from... Uh, y you know what? Second is this Jawa that leaps down, and third, this sword fighter who has so much more reach than me. God damn! It's impossible to hit these guys without taking damage first. It's infuriating. Look how low my health is, and it's the first screen. Alright, I'm up the stairs, and a barrage of arrows that I can't duck under nearly kills me. Okay, one more guy, and... What? He... He, d he doesn't take damage. Try as I may, I, I literally cannot hurt him. Let's just run to the next room, and... Ah, dead. Okay. I persist in utter confusion for the next 15 minutes to try and beat this level, and I just can't. It's just invulnerable enemies, projectiles, bats, unavoidable attacks. It's a nightmare. The initial experience of Eight Eyes is bewildering in a way that I haven't experienced in a while. Nothing really makes sense. There's no clear rules, and what little you can understand is really just you being beaten senselessly. Defeated. Battered. I consult the strategy wiki, only to discover that I've been playing the game completely wrong this whole time. So, see this stage select screen? This is a lie. A misdirect. At the end of each level is one of eight dukes who are the main baddies. Defeating a duke gives you a sword that's more powerful, but only against one of the other dukes, meaning that there is a hard order. Now, this isn't inherently bad. I mean, Mega Man's been doing it for decades. The difference is, 
The special weapons in Mega Man widen the tools at your disposal. They make traversing the other levels more interesting and promotes experimentation against the bosses to try and find their weaknesses. The first time I play a Mega Man game, I like to go in blind because I actually like the experience of figuring the game out myself. You don't get any of this in Eight Eyes because the swords have zero application outside of boss fights and they don't even do anything differently. They're both arbitrary and necessary, which equals sucks. Finish. <sighs> it's not it's not bad, it's just special. Okay, so it turns out the easiest starting level is Spain and Arabia was dead last. Good. No, good. Remember how confusing and frustrating it was to fight these sword guys? Well, this basic enemy type is recycled throughout the entire game, but there's actually a trick to fighting them. If you wait for them to approach, you can hit them with the edge of your sword before they can attack, and while they're flashing, they can't hurt you, meaning you can double back and go in for the next strike. It's actually kind of fun, and much more dance-like than other games of the era. If you get the pattern of their swings down, you can avoid damage entirely for most of the level. Spain itself is pretty straightforward. It's a few floors you need to go up, then down again before beating the boss. It's also where I discovered that Cutrus is not just a backpack. By pressing up and B, you can detach the bird. Cutrus will fly back and forth across the screen, collecting any items he touches, and you can make him do this dive attack. He's invaluable for one major aspect of this game, secrets. Almost every screen has some secret breakable block that reveals an item. Usually a blue jar that increases your life cap by a block for the rest of the level. Getting these is really important to making the bosses bearable. Spain has a few different sword fighters, these skulls that move weirdly, archers, and this ape man. He's special because for some reason, according to the guide, Orin can't hurt him. Only Cutrus can't. Oh! Oh, that must have been what this guy's deal was. Thank you, game. Thank you for telegraphing that certain enemies can only be defeated using this finicky dive bomb attack. Let's talk about the rest of the combat, I guess. So on top of the fixed horizontal attack, the knockback on hit, destroying enemy projectiles, and the locked jump, Eight Eyes also borrows the items from Castlevania wholesale. Well, it's not a one-to-one -one copy, but you do collect them from enemies and spend hearts, I mean crosses, to use them. First up is the knife, which is a serviceable ranged attack, and then there's- These don't matter. None of these matter. The only item that matters is the ice ball. Why? Cheesing bosses. The ice ball freezes enemies in place for a few seconds and just lets you wail on them. It creates a serious balance problem because it is so valuable for taking down bosses that you will conserve all of your item energy for it at the end of the level, basically rendering the rest of the items useless. It's a shame because they seem cool, but every time you use one it's on accident and prompts a... God damn it. Because now you have to grind crosses again. In fact, the guide even points out rooms that are good for this. At the very least, you can actually switch between them at any time, which is a nice quality of life adjustment compared to Castlevania. The Duke of Spain goes down easily with the ice ball after you get a life lead on him. You can just kind of brute force the fight. After you complete every castle, you get this little scene of Orin drinking tea with the boss, served by a skeleton? I guess we're cool now. Next up is Egypt, which I don't have much to say about. Every level sort of just plays like the others, with a few exceptions. Uh, they don't really have any gimmicks to set them apart besides their visuals and enemies, but the enemies also tend to just be reskins of a few basic concepts. At the same time, it isn't unenjoyable. The back and forth combat is still entertaining. A lot of outlets really lambasted this thing for the controls, and I can see where they're coming from. I'm someone who can deal with wonky controls. Like, I'm the guy who will go to bat for System Shock 1. You should play the Enhanced Edition, though. At the same time, this game really could have used an extra button. Even when I got used to the special inputs for releasing the bird and using items, it would still just happen when I didn't mean to. Especially when jumping or using stairs. Like, accidentally letting go of Cutrus isn't the worst thing in the world, but wasting item energy is always really annoying. 
I wished they just mapped it to select, which isn't used for anything. Anyway, you work your way through this level much like the last one, fighting skeletons, ogres, mudmen, throwing molotovs. I feel like this got a lot weirder than the last level. Is this ripping off the horror enemies from Castlevania, or what? Okay, let's check the manual to figure out what's going on. After hundreds of years of chaos, mankind has finally emerged from the ruins of nuclear war. The world of the distant future has once again flourished under the guidance of the Great King who harnessed the power of the Eight Eyes to rebuild the planet. These strange jewels of power were formed at the eyes or centers of the eight nuclear explosions which nearly destroyed the Earth. In the wrong hands, the Eight Eyes could cause untold destruction. And now... They have been seized by the Great King's eight dukes in a desperate bid to gain control of the world for themselves. They have banished the King to the nuclear wastelands, and already their squabbling threatens to plunge the world into war once again. The task of retrieving the Eight Eyes falls to you, Orin the Falconer, the bravest and mightiest of the King's guardsmen. With your fighting Falcon Cutrus, you must penetrate each of the Duke's castles. There you will face the Duke's soldiers and battle strange nuclear mutants such as living skeletons, giant wasps, and mud men. You must defeat the monstrous boss of each castle to retrieve the jewel of power he guards. Then to complete your quest, return the Eight Eyes to the Altar of Peace to await the return of the Great King so that he may finish the rebuilding of Earth. Your reward will be the eternal gratitude of all mankind. What the fuck, this wizard? This guy's the worst boss in the whole game. He jumps around like an asshole, kept running out of crosses for this section. Just... Ooh! Next up, Italy. Yeah, looks just like it. More of the same, you fight these disgusting, mostly naked, balding men with pitchforks, as well as actually mutated Italians. The boss has a panther you can just kill before picking up a hidden invulnerability power-up that makes him even easier than Spain. Uh, this is another reoccurring thing. Power-ups in boss rooms that render the fights almost trivial. India is a level. Africa pulls the very NES trick of being a looping maze. You enter this room, go up or down, then fall through the hole on the right to escape. It is a little more interesting in that once you get over the hump of leaving the loop, you end up traveling all around the level as opposed to just barreling straight through. It's okay. The Duke of Africa is both inappropriate for Africa, but appropriate for the Mad Max world of this game. So uh, there's that. Germany is yet another maze crawling with knights and skulls. The boss is, according to information from Nintendo Wiki, named Walter Schmidt, who throws pointy swastikas? Those are not swastikas. Those, those are just shurikens. The manual even calls them throwing stars. Why are you reaching so hard to make him a Nazi in this progressive post-apocalyptic society? Hey, speaking of the manual, let's take a look at this all-star lineup of enemies featuring classic foes like Shrimp, Scimitar Sam, Yoga, Sir Slice, Crossboy, Jack, Knife, Ugly, Baldy, Hardball, Ninjo, Spit, and Rock. After defeating this non-Nazi, I can finally return to Arabia. Using all my skills, all my knowledge of the inner workings of this game, by which I mean the strategy guide. And it's about as hard as every other level. It does throw a lot of enemies at you though, so you do need to get good at the combat dance. The final level is the House of Ruth, a boss rush versus every duke you fought so far, except for Walter who I assume is volunteering at his local Jewish community center. Guys, I thought we were friends! We drank tea! Come on! To make the level select mechanic even more pointless, you don't keep any of the damage bonuses from the swords, so it's just raw talent now, baby. By which I mean the ice ball. Every boss leaves a cross that refills all of your health and item power, so the only annoying part is the goddamn wizard. At last, you face the final boss. Some lady in an animal skull hat with a whip? Once she's down, it's time for your final challenge. 
All throughout the game, you can collect these hidden hint scrolls that tell you the order you need to place the gems you got from the dukes in. Once you have them lined up, you're treated to this very... slow... victory message given by... Uh, is this the king? The great king who's bringing balance to the land? If you move a few pixels, that cross on his forehead would easily become inverted. In fact, isn't it kind of weird that there's Christian crosses all over this game? It's in the power-ups, it's plastered on the pillars of the last level, and it shows up on this gargoyle statue creature that's supposed to be the king. Maybe this wouldn't be strange if Nintendo of America wasn't infamous for censoring any references to religion in their games. Symbols like crosses were removed from Castlevania, Dragon Quest, even DuckTales had crosses removed from tombstones. But they're allowed here? What makes it stranger is that in those games the crosses are thematically appropriate. Castlevania is about battling evil demonic monsters, Dragon Quest features churches of the in-universe religion, and a game like ActRaiser literally has you playing as a personification of the capital G God. But Eight Eyes doesn't have any of that. The monsters here are the result of genetic mutations. Ghost-like things appear in one level, and there's a few bosses who use sorcery, but there's nothing that really paints it as a struggle with the forces of the devil. I really did as much digging as I could to see if there was any kind of funny conspiracy theory I could come up with by linking a bunch of tenuously related facts. But no. It's just... kinda random. Eight Eyes isn't a bad game. It's pretty fun once you get a handle on it. Still, that fun element is battling through layers of questionable design that come off as the devs trying to imitate its much more successful inspirations. If you don't mind wrestling with controls a bit and use a walkthrough, this is an enjoyable enough game to drop two hours into. A thinking Rabbit wouldn't survive past the mid-90s, and it's easy to see why. Their follow-ups to Eight Eyes were more derivative block-pushing games released for platforms like the TurboGrafx-16 and PC-98. Not bad systems by any means, but ones that didn't have very bright futures. They did stray away from their comfort zone a little bit with RPGs like Record of Lodos War and text mysteries like Madeline and a clown murder mystery. This makes me feel weird. One of their last games would be Maten Densetsu Senritsu no Opats, a pretty shameless knockoff of concepts from Shin Megami Tensei, although the artwork is pretty sick. They never technically went defunct as they were acquired by Falcon at some point, the developer of Ease and the Trail series. Hey, so, uh, editing Taigen, uh, turns out I misspoke. What I just said was a lie. Uh, they were not acquired by Falcon. Calm. I actually misread that. They were acquired by Falcon, like the like the bird, like the, the bird that Orin had, like Cutrus. So Falcon appears to be some kind of a software company that was founded in 1988, uh, and they appear to they have a website with a bunch of the stuff that they've done and all the genres, but. Um, no real listing I could find of, like, specific software besides stuff that they basically just absorbed from Thinking Rabbit, like uh, Sokoban. You can play Sokoban on their website. Ooh. Uh, yeah, it also looks like they haven't done anything since, like, 2016. So, uh, I have no idea what, what any of that is about. This company is a mystery. Uh, both of these companies are a mystery. Was there any point to this video? Uh... Detach the bird. Thank you so much for watching Space War Olympics 2 at 1000 subs. Bye.